left this for us, to remember him. And as we remember him, may it transform us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Next week, you're going to receive a nomination form. A half page will be in the bulletin. It's, it has about it at the top, some lines for you to, to write in the name or names of men that you have observed and think, you know, I believe God's raising them up to be a deacon. And we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. Attached to that same sheet are the brief explanations of 1 Timothy 8, 3, 8 to 13, which is Paul's instruction to Timothy of the qualifications of a deacon. And just brief explanations about what we as a congregation, how we understand those verses. I thought it was good today to just simply ask the question, what is a deacon? And the text that I'm going to start with is simply Paul's opening words, if you look at Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. You say, why in the world would you read Philippians 1.1? 1, 1? Well, I want you to see, because see, by the time this letter is written, Paul is addressing specifically Timothy, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, so to the church, with the overseers, the word overseer there is episkopos, you hear episcopalian in that, but, but overseer, elder, pastor, those are interchangeable words for the same office, with the overseers and deacons. The reason I read this is that by the time Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, the idea of the diaconate as an office was established. The background to this word, this diakonos, and when you look at that, you see, wait a minute, it's, uh, it really hadn't even been translated for us. Diakonos becomes deacon. It's been transliterated. It takes the, the language, the sound of it, diakonos, and makes it deacon in English. So it's not translated. But it occurs in the scripture attached to the word servant, our minister, and you know our, uh, our bulletin, we put the graphic on the bulletin that we did, deacons are servant leaders following to lead, that is following Christ in order to lead. I want, you to, I want that to grip you in your mind. The word diakonos, actually when you go back and look at it outside of the scripture, when you see its usage in the Greek language, meant one who kicks up the dust. Now, that picture comes to us in two ways today. Someone who stirs up dust or stirs up controversy, but one, the idea is behind it, one who is moving. You couldn't move in that day and time and dust not be stirred up. So it's, a, it's someone on the move. Someone engaged. There'd be no such notion as a passive deacon. The idea of being a deacon is to be engaged. And over time, from the time we see, I think we see it surfacing in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 to 7, which we read together responsively, from the time it comes up out of need to the time Paul writes at Philippi, it's become an established office of the church. In fact, you will read some writers who will say that Christ has left two offices, two types of office bearers, in his church. One is the pastor, elder, overseer, and one is the deacon. When you look at the Greek New Testament usage of the word, it emphasizes ministering or serving. The diaconate, D-I-A-C-O-N-A-T-E, the diaconate is a body of people called forth to lead in that. Let's look at some scriptures just very quickly where you see, you see the general use of the term in the New Testament. John chapter 2, verse 5 to 9. You know this is when, when the wedding feast in Cana was taking place. 
They run out of wine, and Jesus' mother says in verse 5, to the servants, that is to the deacon, do whatever he tells you. Those who were, who were performing a service, who were ministering at the wedding. Matthew twenty-two thirteen, the one attending the king. Then the king said to his attendants, and the word attendance there is that idea of the diakonos. A servant of Satan is even described with this word, 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen. It's no surprise if his, that is Satan's servants, his deacons, if, if you want to get the, get the gist of it, disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. A servant of God, spoken of this way in 2 Corinthians 6, 4. But as servants of God, as deaconoid, deaconoid, the servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Paul saying that. 2 Corinthians 11, 11.23, where Paul is asking, are these people who are, are besmirching my ministry, are they servants of Christ? There's the word. I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman here. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. In other words, I've served Christ in some pretty, pretty intense ways. A servant of the church, which is, which is where we think this office develops. In Colossians 1, 24 and 25, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh I'm willing to fill up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister. And there's the word. So the idea is that deacons are servant leaders following to lead. What you'll see when you, when you go through this, look at a, a political ruler just real quickly. It's used of this in Romans 13, 4. For he, that is the, the magistrate, is God's servant, that's the word, diakonos, for your good. And we, our society needs to recover that notion, by the way. We were losing it. We were becoming an anarchistic society, just anarchy everywhere. Now, what I want you to see further is that the idea of someone being a diakonos is church-wide, that, that everyone who is bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and joined to a local visible expression of his, of his church is called to serve. Matthew 20, verses 26 and 28. He's, he's chiding them about the way the Gentiles lorded over people, Jesus says. It shall not be so among you, he says, but whoever would be great among you must be your diakonos, your servant. Here be first, must be your slave, even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. Luke 22, 26 and 27 is the same thing, so about the same episode. And then Jesus teaches that on the final judgment, a discussion will take place about ministry. Who, who ministered? Not who held the office, who ministered? Verses 31 to 46 in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and the angels come with Him, He'll sit on His glorious throne and before Him all will be gathered, all the nations. He'll separate people from one another as shepherds separate sheep from goats. Place the sheep on His right hand, the hand of His authority, His pleasure, His blessing, the goats on the left. The King will say to those on His right, Come you who are blessed by My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. If I was hungry and you gave Me food, Thirsty, you gave me drink. A stranger, you welcomed me. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. In prison, you came to me. The righteous will say, well, when did we do that to you, Lord? Verse 38 and then 39. And the king will answer in verse 40. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then he has a very different message for those on his left who did not serve. And the warning is that if you do not approach being a part of the body of Christ as an opportunity to minister to the least of these, then you, no matter what your speech is withstanding, notwithstanding, you haven't ministered to him. What point am I making here? In the Gospels, the idea of service Servanthood is attached to every believer. When you move into the, to the letters, 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. Many, many members, all servant hearts. In Romans 12, he actually, in verse 7, he actually singles out the idea of servanthood as a manifestation of giftedness. And I would submit to you that probably this gift is the most predominant in the body of Christ because it is this gift that is necessary to move and ac accomplish the advance of the gospel and the care of the people of God. He says in Romans 12, 7, if it's service, then in our serving. Another one, 1 Peter 4, 11 Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Same word. And so we know that the office, I believe at least, the office originated in what we call a prototype in Acts when the controversy arose the, the, between the, the uh, Hellenists and the Jews, Hellenists and the Hebrews. The Hellenists were Greek background believers, Gentile background believers, and they, they felt that they were not being treated with the same dignity and respect and concern as the Jewish background believing women were. The apostles faced a challenge. How can we minister the word, pray for the flock, pray for the advance of the gospel, minister the word, if we had to take care, start taking care of controversies like this? And having the mind of Christ, the apostles went to the people and said, Select seven men from you, and they give some things to look for. The people did that. It seemed good to them to do that. They, they had, I think, something like a nomination process, and these seven men rose to the top. Two of them would become evangelist preachers, Stephen and Philip. Stephen would be martyred. Philip would be involved in one of the greatest, one of the early great awakenings since Pentecost. Yet he'd be taken from that Samaritan Pentecost, as it's been called, and placed with an Ethiopian eunuch and share the gospel faithfully so that the gospel hit Africa. They were servants. They were simply willing to do whatever needed to be done for the welfare of the body of Christ and the advance of the gospel. If you look at Luke 4.20, Jesus shows us this role as he, as he reads as a rabbi, but as he functions as a servant. When you move, as I said, from, from the episode in Acts 6 to Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, you have seen the role of the deacon identified for this to, to what? Following to lead, deacon, men who are following Jesus Christ to lead. You see, part of the problem is that there are people who have servant hearts but don't know how to lead in that. And there are people who know how to lead but don't have haven't cultivated servant hearts that are, that are precious and, and blessed. And so what a congregation is looking for, because the, the qualifications for deacon in 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, are what, what one uh, teacher has called unremarkable. In other words, they're qualifications that every child of God should have. You might say, well, the leading of the household, that would fall to, to male responsibility. And that's true. But it doesn't mean that for the female believer, there's not a responsibility in the care and nurture and development of the household. So I want you to just look at people who were named deacons in the scripture. So we wrap this up. First of all, Timothy is called that in 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. 
Paul says, we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith. He's a co-worker. He's a, he's a deacon. 1 Timothy 4, 6 develops on this. If you put these things before the brothers, he says, you will be a good servant of Christ. There it is, deacon. Being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you followed. Tychicus, another helper of Paul's in Colossians 4, 7. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful deacon and fellow servant. Epaphras, the same in Colossians 1, 7. He calls him Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. Paul's including himself in that. Faithful minister of Christ. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. When, the, when he's, he's chiding the Corinthian church for picking their favorite preachers, some, wanted, some like Paul, some like Apollos, some like Peter, some demonstrated an amazingly prideful attitude and said, oh, you men, you men worshipers, I only follow Christ. He says in verse 5, Who, what then is Apollos? What's Paul? Servants through whom you believe. And the point I'm making is that Paul the apostle who fit the, fit the role of apostle did not uh, shy back from identifying himself with that term diakonos. And then even Jesus Christ, look at this in Romans 15, 8. As Paul is wrapping up his letter to the church at Rome, I tell you that Christ became a servant, a diakonos, to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. He served the Jews. So, Biblical deaconing, and you know, we don't have, we don't have a problem with this here, really. Uh, the deacons that God has raised up in more recent years have servant hearts about them. They're servant leaders. But in some churches, that's not the case. I remember one fellow standing up saying, when I was a deacon at such and such church, I wouldn't even let us do so. That's not the tone, the attitude, the spirit. It's not characterized by power and prominence. A service to others. I was serving in a church in, in Louisiana. We were going through Reformation there in the mid to late 80s. And a fellow was running for office, district attorney. He was a member of the church, but he was just on the rolls. He wasn't active at all. So he, someone suggested, you need to get active. In fact, it'd be great if you could be a deacon in that church. It'd look good on your resume if you're running for office that you're so. He showed up as the elect of the campaign was getting off the ground, and before I knew it, he had talked our Sunday school director into letting him teach a Sunday school class. And then he made it known that with deacon elections coming up, he would like to be a deacon. Well, I mean clearly he was by any any biblical measurement was not fit to be a deacon. So, and I heard about the history. I said, where'd this come from? Well, that's just been a history here where a fellow running for office, they know it's to their advantage to become a deacon at First Baptist Church. So I said, well, that's not what the scripture teaches. So I preached what became an infamous sermon in that town, why we will stop crowning deacons in our church. We went through what the qualifications of a deacon are. And the folks, it's interesting, the folks caught it. And the man did not accomplish his aspiration of getting the title deacon to add to his political resume. In fact, the Christian diaconate contrasted sharply with the prevailing thought of service in the Greek world, the Gentile world. You see, in the Gentile world of the Greeks, it was considered unworthy of the dignity of free men to be a servant. Plato, one of the Philosophers said, how can a man be happy when he has to serve someone? Wow. Yet we know as Christians, just the opposite is true. If you're feeling down in the dumps, if you're struggling, one of the best things you can do is get your focus on someone who has a need and go meet that need in the name of Jesus. Share with them, bear their burden. And it's remarkable what a blessing comes and a lifting of the difficulty you're having just comes off of you because there is great joy in serving one another. 
There are subtle differences in the office of a pastor, elder, a bishop in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. But many of, the, many of the qualifications there are what we call unremarkable. The apt to teach, the, the capacity to teach sound doctrine would be an exception to that perhaps. So when we say to you, next week, look out among you, watch for men who have these marks about them. Well, the first thing, there ought to be plenty to pick from. If the men are taking seriously what it means to be a servant in the body of Christ. But there will be some who can not only serve but model that and are modeling that. And it's not a rejection of others as it is a recognizing that God has put, made this prominent, these servant leaders, to lead us. And I believe that you will pray about this this week and that you'll have in your mind the name or names of men that God has particularly impressed upon them the importance of serving the body of Christ, of serving one another, of serving the world, and they would be a wonderful example to the body of Christ were they to be selected as deacons. Our current deacon body, which has Norman Hare as the chairman, Curtis Griffin as the vice chairman, Barry Morgan as the secretary, Joe Ramey, and Gene Russell, Charles Ward, who serves in a deacon emeritus capacity, still caring for families. I can tell you that they would like for you as a congregation to see more men raised up, which would allow one of the things we mentioned in our Constitution and bylaws for a deacon rotation, a three-year rotation of our deacon body. It's difficult, folks, to hold down full-time jobs, care for families, and be faithful servant leaders in the body of Christ. And so we, we look at that and say, why don't we bring relief to that? We've lost some deacons in recent years, moving off health issues. Clearly with Brother Gene Russell's condition, we need someone to step up in his place, and I trust you to do that. And I want you to know that what you have done in placing these men in those servant positions, you, you have blessed this church in doing that. They're a precious group of men. And I'm looking forward to see who the Lord lays on your heart to join that wonderful gathering of men who along with me make up our pastoral ministries team. I did a search. Our Constitution and Bylaws mentions the word deacon 53 times. 53 times. And my prayer is that as we go through this process again, we haven't done it in two or three years or more, that the result that the early church experienced in Acts 6, that when they took care, when they addressed the issue biblically, redemptively, securing the mind of Christ and, and applying it, that the church was blessed. Their influence became greater in the community and the number of the disciples was increased and multiplied. That's, I'm longing to see that. Now next week is Mother's Day. I'm going to ask the question next Sunday, what is a deaconess? be a good thing for us to think about in the light of what the scripture has to say about that. It's not going to surprise many of you based on what I've said today, but the scripture has a word on that. So I pray that you're planning to have a wonderful day, good fellowship together in the fellowship meal following, and that during the week we'll pray and that God will put it on our hearts and we'll come back with one mind to advance the servant ministry of this congregation. Let's pray together.